This is Urban Agriculture, episode number 20, California Dreaming. Urban Agriculture, episode number 20, recorded on October 13th, 2015. Hey, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and with me is Dixon Despommiers. Hello, Vincent. How have you been? Been very well, thanks. And you? I've been in Germany. I was going to ask, are you practicing your German? No, or? no, I don't, I don't know much <laughs> German. I'm back. I'm back. You're back. So we have another guest today, Dixon. We do. We are highlighting the movers and shakers in, this, in this area. This. I have a name for this show, too. What's that? California Dreamin'. Yeah, that could be a good one. <laughs> but another one could be family farming, because as you will see, it seems like the whole family is involved with this one, but let's find out. Yeah, exactly. Our guest today is the president and CEO of Urban Produce, nice. Ed Horton. Welcome, Ed. Guys, thanks for having us. And I've got uh, my daughter, uh, as we <laughs> indicated, our Love family it. business. I've got Danielle. She is our marketing director, and she'll be joining us today as well. Hey, Hi. Danielle. Hello, Danielle. Hello. So you, you have your daughter and son and wife involved in this business. Is that right? That is correct. Yes, uh, both uh, Danielle and Tyler uh, have business ag degrees from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and uh, have come into the business and helped mom and dad get this off the ground. Nice. That's great. I, I admire you for involving your entire family. <laughs> yeah, I have been called crazy. but yes, <laughs> <laughs> So, Ed, I'd like to start by finding out your path to uh, running urban produce. What where did you grow up in the first place? Are you Californian? No, um, I spent uh, spent a lot of time as a uh, young man and uh, going into my twenties uh, and whatnot. Lived all over the United States. My my father uh, worked for W R Grace, and we were transferred all over the place. Spent most of my life uh, in uh, Texas. Um, actually, that's changed now. I've been in California now longer, but. Um, when uh, relative to vertical farming, I, I'll tell you, it goes way, way back. Uh, in Texas, we had greenhouses in our backyard. Right. <laughs> and uh, when I uh, came home from high school, I was responsible for going into uh, the greenhouse and moving all of those trays from one to two, two to three, three to four, four back up to one, and then water the entire. <laughs> right. Uh, and I always, uh, always thought there was a better way. So, um, I actually, uh, my career has uh, been on the technology side. Uh, I worked for Thomson Reuters for a number of years and uh, have, have now come together with technology and agriculture to uh, build what we call a high-density vertical growing unit, uh, i.e. vertical farming here in Irvine. And, um, and we look to expand that and build in other locations in the U.S. How, how long has Urban Produce been uh, running? Um, I started Urban Produce in October of 2013, mm -hmm. so we're in October, so exactly two years now. And why did you choose California to do this? You know, we, um, we live in Laguna Niguel, California, and I've been out here since the late 80s, um, and so we... Uh, we have our roots here and uh, looked all over the place and just uh, came across this property in Irvine and uh, worked out a really, really um, uh, a good situation for us, not too far from home. And we felt if we could be successful uh, with vertical farming here in California, that we could be pretty much successful anywhere. <laughs> uh, well, you... Uh uh, you landed on the right spot and the stars are aligned in your favor because obviously we're going to get into the drought situation pretty soon in our discussion. And uh, you have a solution for that, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, we um, we have formed a partnership with a, a group in Los Angeles. And even though um, our specific technology, we don't use that much water. We only give our products exactly what they need, uh, when they need it. Everything is automated. Um, the vertical growing unit, and, and I can't wait to have you guys come out and visit the next time you're out here, but our product moves around in the building. So unlike uh, traditional farming, uh, we take the product to the light, we take the product to the water, to the nutrients, 
and it uh, it rotates uh, very similar to your dry cleaning when you go pick that up. Neat. So we just move our product around in the building for airflow and and light distribution, and our. Uh, are pretty comfortable with the process and the volume that we're able to produce out of this location. Sounds great. Um, I am familiar with the uh, the vertical farm that's currently in operation in Singapore with Jack Eng, mm-hmm. uh, who also has a, not a similar, I wouldn't say it's a similar system, but he, he uses a, a series of pulleys and pendulums to rotate his crops past the windows as well. So uh, <clears throat> I like that feature. Um, do you... Um, you don't use soil in your growing systems, though, do you? No, we do not. We're a, uh, a USDA organic certified, so no soil. Amazing. So it's all hydroponic, or maybe yes. you've got another word for it now. Um, yeah, hydro- hydroponic is fair, um, and, and we don't shy away from that. But, yes, we have our own uh, blend. Uh, we not only use a uh, uh, certified organic substrate, but we also do uh, tea brewing. and oh, we. Nice have our own tea brewing methods that we apply to the substrate to really uh, try to get the, the root structure going. And cool. so from a biological standpoint, it's, it's working well for us. Nice. So we've interviewed a lot of um, other urban farmers that are now growing vertically. Uh, what are you growing? Well, right now we are uh, doing, uh, we've got nine different types of microgreens from uh, arugula, broccoli, cabbage, wasabi bok choy, uh, Thai basils, lemon basils, uh, amaranth, uh, beets. So all types of herbs and or microgreens. And really what kind of separates us from from some of our competitors out here is we grow and deliver a live product. <laughs> nice. <Yeah. laughs> nice. So you, your idea is local, right? You want to have the, the material you're producing consumed locally and then make more farms wherever it's needed, correct? That is correct. You don't want to ship your stuff to New York City, right? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, no, but we we, uh, we have expansion plans. So we're looking in the Cincinnati, Harrisburg, Atlanta, San Antonio, Denver areas. Cool. And specifically for logistics, where my customers are. And uh, I'm sure you two gentlemen are familiar with the uh, food safety modernization oh, yeah. and what locally grown is going to mean to most of us soon and and uh, how consumers look at that. And uh, we know based on research that has been presented to us that locally grown has become very, very important to the consumer. So, yes, that means yeah. a lot to us. What's your footprint? How big a farm do you have right now? The, the growing unit that we have here in Irvine, it sits on about 5,800 square feet, and then that equates to about one-eighth of an acre. And you did a calculation to tell us how much outdoor acreage that represents. <laughs> yeah, and again, um, that could be a misnomer, but it really depends on what you're growing. Sure. We, we grow herbs, so as an example on our microgreens, I can get uh, – three, maybe even four turns, uh, four harvests a month. So I'm able to really process and get a lot of product through. So about 16 acres relative to herbs. And we also sell quite a bit of uh, wheatgrass. Nice. Do you have any sense of how much water you use and how much that would be compared to if you were growing outside? Uh, absolutely do. So we use about 93% less water. <laughs> than Sorry, we, we're not used to those numbers over here. <laughs> Currently, it's showering outside of our window, and I know that's an envious position to be in for, compared to where you guys are. But 93% less, that sounds almost like you're doing it uh, aeroponically. No, uh, we are we are not. Uh, we don't have a closed loop system not using aeroponics. We have a, a method where... Uh, again, as the product is uh, put onto the growing unit, uh, it is input into the computer system. All of the carriers have an RFID tag on them, nice. and we uh, we instruct uh, the software how much water, how much uh, nutrients, uh, et cetera, et cetera, to give a particular uh, carrier uh, wheatgrass and uh, microgreens and or a mature basil or whatever we're growing at all. Uh, requires different amounts of water uh, and or nutrients, but 
Uh, I would take the 93% one step further. Um, it is our goal as a company to uh, be as sustainable as possible. Sure. Uh, it is my goal to be uh, completely off the grid one day. Um, I have accomplished 50% of that. We have formed a partnership with a company in Los Angeles and we actually produce our own water uh, kind of like a dehumidifier relative to uh, the air in the growing unit. And we produce about 120 gallons of uh, filtered clean water on a daily basis. And your energy budget? Uh, labor's one. Energy is, is number two. And so we're working mm -hmm. through, uh, we've figured out the, the water situation. And uh, I'm looking at different lighting slash solar options. Right. Yeah, I was going to ask you if you think that at some point solar could supply all of your electrical needs. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That's the ultimate goal. You bet. That's why he's in California, Dixon. <laughs> <laughs> of course. But that, Florida is known as the sunshine state. I just thought California was... <laughs> no, that's okay. So uh, what about and wind power? I know that California has a lot of wind farms in various places. Uh, how about your location? Is that amenable to that also? No, I think uh, I'm very familiar with the wind farms as you head out to the Palm Desert, Indian right. Wells area and, right. and everything that goes through that canyon, but with uh, regulations and whatnot here in uh, Orange County and specifically the cities that are around here, they're, they're not going to let us put one of those up. Right. So, Ed, let me uh, have you describe a little more the, the growing area. So I'm looking at a photo on your website of these racks, okay? Mm -hmm. So you're growing uh, your plants in racks. And t how high are these racks? Uh, are they one story or so or less? Uh, I'm about uh, from floor to the top of that carrier is about 28 feet. Right. And the building itself is how much higher? Uh, I have a 30-foot 30, uh, 30 clearance on the top. Okay. So these racks take up pretty much most of the vertical space. Yes, sir. And are they – is all the space within the building filled with the racks or just near the windows? I think you have windows there, right? Um, we actually separated. That's poly. Yeah. So uh, I, I do separate that side because, you know, being a CEA grower, we're we're controlling the temp and the humidity on that side of the. Yep. Uh, so the the cooling and the packing and the receiving and all that is on the other side, kind of where you're looking into. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, the other side of that building is is for other other items. Do these racks move on their own, or they just or they just rotate? Uh, they move uh, twenty four seven. The only time the system is actually sitting still is when we're harvesting and and taking product on and off. Okay, and you you do a mix of sunlight and artificial lighting. Is that right? No, we're strictly um, uh, LED. So Philips is our oh, partner. Oh, okay. Because mm -hmm. okay. so you mentioned in the, on your website that you could use some natural lighting, right? But this this particular site is not set up for that. That is correct. So this is strictly LED as an example. And, and, and to clarify, you know, I am classified as a controlled environmental, environmental agricultural grower because I'm in a building. Uh, there is no reason why I can't take our patented growing technology and put it in a greenhouse and sure. use Mr. Sun to uh, help okay. us. And we will more than likely put that type of configuration together mm -hmm. when we go into San Antonio, say. Mm -hmm. Are you growing 24 hours or do you give them a little break? Yeah, right. Again, depending on the crop, but relative to what we're growing now, it's a 20 on, 4 off. Got it. And why, why are the racks rotating? Is that because the light is, is just at the top of the building? No, uh, there's actually light tunnels, LED light tunnels that we have in the growing area, and the product moves through those light tunnels, mm, Okay. Num number one. Number two, we, we want, uh, relative to the technology and the patents that we have and why it moves, and, and people ask that quite a bit, is airflow. We want some airflow on the product, sure. and then we also uh, have a watering station. So it's, again, all computer programmed, and the product uh, during the day, or at night when nobody's here, we'll move around to a watering station and all 25 rows uh, will get watered simultaneously. So do you know a guy by the name of Caleb Harper? 
I do not. Oh, well, you need to meet him. Because <laughs> we had him on our show the last time. That was uh, episode number 19. <laughs> 18, 18. 18. Sorry, 18. And Caleb uh, is at MIT, and he ha has a little box uh, inside of which are single plants, and then you can manipulate all the parameters, the humidity, temperature, uh, conductivity, oxygen, all that stuff. And mm -hmm. I, I think he would just absolutely fell if he could see what you're doing. Yeah, we would. Uh, I would love to get engaged. We're we're an open book. Uh, we're excited about vertical farming, and and uh, we go to conferences. We're going to seed stock next month, which is down in San Diego, and nice. And uh, uh, we, we want to uh, share and learn, and, and uh, we believe this is the way growing has got to go relative to specifically yeah. situations in California. Exactly. Have you got any buy-in from the California Agriculture Department? Uh, they have been here as well as the USDA. Uh, and then I have, uh, let me see, how am I going to say this? I have a, uh, a former secretary of agriculture that, that is soon to be on our board, which uh, we're really, really looking forward to, to, nice. to that happening. That wouldn't be Mr. Kawasaki by any chance, would it? <laughs> I, I wish I could answer that. Ed. <laughs> <laughs> so um, about maybe five years ago now, I was invited to a conference at Cal Poly in Pomona, uh, to address the technical advisory board for the agriculture department at uh, in California. And it was a very interesting meeting because Gene Giacomelli was invited as well. And he presented them with uh, hydroponically grown tomatoes. And none of them could actually accept the fact that hydroponically grown tomatoes could taste so good. <laughs> and of course, they do if you know what you're doing because you can control the taste as well as uh, the water content and things of this sort. And they were their eyes were absolutely wide open. They were they were incredulously uh, skeptical to begin with. And then because he cut up those tomatoes and he served them and he allowed them to taste them and have them for part of their lunch, uh, they came right on board. So I just... I know that California would love to see more of this, and I'm sure Jerry Brand would like to encourage more of this because of the conservation aspects and because you can still have your fresh produce. Mm -hmm. uh, just wondered if uh, you got the governor to come over and take a look. <laughs> it could work. It could work. Uh, it's, a, it's an open door, and, and I, I would also like to comment on uh, Dr. Giacomelli. Um, sure. I was over at uh, U of A two weeks ago and spoke uh, at the CEA oh, yeah. uh, uh, unit that he has down there. Gene and I have uh, started to form a relationship, Excellent. and uh, I really, really enjoy uh, and, and Sherry, uh, Dr. Kubota, and what she's doing over there yes. with uh, strawberries and whatnot. So. What, what we're doing is we, we form these uh, collaborations, and so we, we've started this with uh, Dr. Giacomelli and, and the CEA uh, unit that he has, and then also uh, I'm on a couple of boards up at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, obviously based on uh, my kids uh, graduating from there, and, and we have a, a strong partnership with them and collaboration and whatnot as well. So we're, we're trying to uh, do our best to stay as uh, aligned to um, folks like Gene and others. What about Cal, um, University of California at uh, Davis? Do they have an interest in um, what you're doing? You know, uh, Dr. Thulin um, uh, at Cal Poly and I uh, have not only started working together but became friends, and, and he has threatened me to stay off of the UC Davis campus. <laughs> 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 Got it. <laughs> so I had uh, the mention of Giacomelli makes me uh, it makes a question pop in my head. Have you seen The Martian? Yes, uh, actually, he <laughs> took us uh, over there uh, and, and showed us that, and actually had an opportunity to go inside. That's pr with the movie coming out. It was it was great timing and pretty cool. Yeah, that's neat. I hear uh, he did some press conference somewhere where he explained the science of the Martian. I thought that was great. <laughs> right. So listening to how you can control everything in your growing area, have, do you experiment? Do you have an area set aside where you can change things and see the effects on yields and taste and so forth? Yes. Outside of the, uh, the growing unit, we have a full-on culture lab here in the building and so that's where we uh, we meet. I have uh, I have uh, hired growers, some uh, millennials, some very intelligent young 
uh, millennials that are really, really progressive. And so different substrates, different nutrients, different lighting sequences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know Danielle is, is working with Nicole and Andre, but yes, we have a, a full culture lab that we do all of our testing in to determine whether or not, uh, if it gets through the lab, then I run economic models on it to determine whether or not it can go back out uh, mm -hmm. on the growing unit and uh, be productive. Maybe you should advertise them as uh, millennials, perennials. <laughs> <laughs> Good Dixon. So, um, <clears throat> What are, you, what, what are your plans for diversification in terms of crops that you offer the public? Well, as an example, you know, we started with uh, the microgreens and the wheatgrass. It's got short cycles. And so if anything sure. went wrong, we could change and move that out. And so things are going very smoothly with that. We're in most of the retail uh, chains out here in Southern California and now moving into uh, food services with those products. Nice. So that being said, and to your point of uh, diversification, so we have peppers and beans oh, and nice. strawberries uh, in the uh, lab going through this testing that we're talking about to determine whether or not those are viable. So we're constantly looking at new products. One of the things we saw when we visited the uh uh, green spirit farms in New Buffalo was something called a French breakfast radish, and wondered if you had ever heard of that. It's it's quite an unusual product because uh, as it grows in the substrate that as they designed it, <coughs> the radish actually grows above the level of the substrate that they planted in, so mm. you can actually see the radish. You don't have to dig it out. It's it's actually visible, and uh, it, it was quite an interesting experience to actually taste them. Uh, so some root vegetables might lend themselves very nicely to that approach. I wondered if you'd uh, considered some of those as a part of your repertoire. Well, I would say we've got a number on the drawing board, but that is not one of them. And uh, Danielle is taking copious notes, and we will get that on the board. <laughs> <laughs> so Caleb Harper's big push was to make how you do all of this open source. What do you think about that? I don't think my intellectual property counsel would probably agree. Because <laughs> <laughs> well, that's presenting, for some at least, a problem in getting involved because they don't, they don't know how to get their feet wet, basically. Right. We, um, you know, there's uh, so many positive things going on. I know when you start a business and, and move it out into phases and whatnot, th right. things change. Sure. Uh, our goal was to build Irvine and to scale Irvine. Uh, phase two is to build five other growing units in different parts of the U.S. Right. And phase three is uh, is uh, international licensing I and know. putting together a program to license the technology and, and really move it out. Sure. Um, what has happened over the last couple of months is we have actually had three different countries uh, come to visit us and have dialogue about building uh, our growing units in their country uh, relative to the issues that they're having as well, um, food production, water issues, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So my business plan is is getting twisted a little bit, but you uh, you try to manage it the best you can, and, and we're excited to get the technology out into the industry and and getting in getting it in use. Great. So Ed, all the all the greens that you make currently, where do they end up? Uh, well, right now they end up in Albertsons and Vaughn's and Fresh and Easy and Gelson's and, mm -hmm. and most of the major retailers. Um, one of the advantages, um, as, as you guys know, I mean, we're a we're a uh, we're a business. Um, I'm uh, my wife requires that I make money, um, <laughs> and so we we put a product out. And I think some of the advantages is it's locally grown, it's organic. Uh, and as important, number three, it's live. And, and why is that important? Well, one, it's, it's, it's nutritional value is much higher because you're taking home and eating after you cut it, you're eating a live product. And then additionally, there's such a huge loss in, in retail supermarkets and even in your refrigerator when yeah. you buy that, buy that product and it sat in there for three or four days and then you went back in there to eat it and it was all mushy. Exactly. Right. So we we have a twenty to thirty day shelf life with this live product, um, because of our substrate, 
Uh, that product is growing when it goes out the door. It continues as it's in the supermarkets. And, and we have a YouTube channel where we instruct people how to cut it, how to eat it, how to right. apply it, how to preserve it, um, because we kind of look at it differently. So we're, we're fortunate that, that we're able to deliver a live product to the market. Do you get rid of every? I shouldn't say get rid of, but do you ship out everything you can grow? Could you get bigger, or is that part, is that not that that building you have there? Does that need to get bigger? We are we are not at max capacity yet, mm. uh, and so as we, uh, you know, we started with uh, what I would call retail and the supermarkets, and now uh, the fresh points, the U.S. foods, the Cisco's of the world. Uh, is is where we're headed next relative to the food services industry. So we're we're more than we're we're gauging to be at full capacity uh, in March of next year. So while you were in Las Vegas, <laughs> let's get back to the uh, <clears throat> America's favorite playground. Um, <laughs> it's also one of the great places to go to have a gourmet meal at a fairly reasonable price because they want you to gamble, and obviously they don't want you to gamble with your money for your food. So there are a lot of high-end chefs at a lot of these hotels that offer uh, a great cuisine experience. And I wondered uh, whether or not your approach uh, had appealed to that group of um, high-end you know, cuisine like you see on the Food Channel and stuff like this. Um, ab- absolutely has. And it's really been something that Danielle has been working on for the last year or so. We uh, we got introduced to the folks at the American Culinary Federation. Right. Uh, they were kind enough to uh, introduce us to five chefs throughout different parts of the U.S. And they help us. They helped us. They helped Danielle come up with the the blends that we now oh, produce right. and deliver. So we have a, a, a wasabi bok choy, uh, a hot mama, a California, which is kale. A California, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so great. Uh, they were very, the, the chefs were very instrumental in helping us come up with our blends specific to Las Vegas and our excitement as we go down the road of food services. Uh, Las Vegas is absolutely over the top when it comes to microgreens. Yeah. Uh, I believe they put them on ice cream in Las Vegas. <laughs> That's right. So we're, we're extremely excited, but need the relationship with the large food services carriers. Yeah. They're going through uh, just pallet after pallet after pallet in Las Vegas. They're, the chefs there, to your point, are in love with microgreens. Yep. Ed, you can grow so many things, but you can't grow everything. And in California, indoors, that is. And in California, you know, you can still need to grow things outdoors and use water for that. What's the solution to that? To the outdoor portion? Is it really, are we going to have to stay outside or are you going to conserve enough water so that they can use use it outdoors? Well, I, I would I would answer it this way. Um, I'm not going to. Uh, I can't grow everything. To your point, right? Um, what what I can grow, I can grow very well, and it's a very sustainable approach. Uh, but w- with regards to suggesting that uh, hydroponics or CEA growing is going to replace traditional all traditional conventional farming. Uh, I think is a misnomer. We can certainly help and and adjust, uh, but we we name the company uh, Urban Produce to be able to take product back into the cities, right? Uh, back locally, where we're employing local people. The the local people are eating the produce that's being grown in that area, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we're we're we're. I just want a little piece of the pie. It's a big piece of pie, and I just I just don't see us completely replacing conventional mm-hmm. farms. What kinds of produce do you think can't be grown indoors and probably won't ever be? Well, I, you know, obviously tree fruit, yeah. right? Yeah. So uh, right. The, the, the space required. Um, additionally, relative to my technology or our technology here at Urban Produce, we don't, uh, based on the way it's designed and set up, we don't see or envision uh, viney, uh, 
mm-hmm. you know, K- Casey Howling was kind enough to uh, allow us to tour his facility and, and what a unbelievable process he has at, at Howling's. And we, we just don't see ourselves in the tomato business based mm-hmm. on the way our technology is structured, to give you an example. Right. What about grains? Are they not easy to do indoors? Um, not by me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because obviously the quantity you need may be not suitable to a rack system, right? Exactly. Exactly. What about corn? Could that go indoors? No. No. Well, can it go indoors? Yes. Can it go indoors relative to what we're doing? No. Okay, but other other people might solve that issue. They they might solve that issue, but that's not one battle I'm going to fight. Okay, I understand. You have a your your slice is big enough to make you happy. <laughs> Yes. yes. <laughs> Do you have any plans for hooking this up with animal production, like uh, fish or crustaceans or mollusks? Uh, A- aquaponics? No. no. Okay. No. He's got a clear-cut goal. I see it. I, I feel it. <laughs> I can almost taste it. <laughs> uh, with, with regards to, I would say this, though, uh, you brought up the word animals. We are mm-hmm. looking to move uh uh, a wheat barley uh, blend live product into the pet food industry. Well, I you know I, it's interesting you should say that Ed, because there's a video produced by some guy in the former Yugoslavian uh, Yugoslavia the country where he's feeding about 200 dairy cattle from a building that has a rotating uh, crops on shelves so mm-hmm. that it's alfalfa and oats. And he can feed those 200 cattle every single day using a rotating crop system. So uh, I can send you the link to the video if you're interested in seeing it. It's quite interesting because just before the crop for the day is about to come out of the barn, the cows, they almost know this to the minute, and they start crowding the door. And the moment (laughs) the tractor leaves the building with this big, big cart filled with these, uh, they're sort of harvested uh, with the root systems and everything from these trays, and he just throws them off the back of the car cart, and the cows just go crazy over it. I guess it must taste very good to them, but uh, it does solve a big problem for people who want to have a dairy farm in less than the current acreage would require. And I know California's half of your agricultural industry in California is dairy farming. Yeah, ab- absolutely a huge market. Um, additionally, I, I would say that we have people bring us uh, these ideas and suggestions. Can you do this for us? Can you do that for us? And right. we look at them sure. and, and obviously give them a very honest answer. Mm-hmm. One of the other markets that we're looking at, and I've used the word millennial probably too many times to this point, <laughs> but um, uh, wheatgrass is an example. Sure. There is a, a big shifting trend to take wheatgrass and they call it spray drying. We, we remember it as freeze drying All right. and putting it into a powder form so that you can use the uh, wheatgrass at your leisure into your juice, into your food, and, and you don't have to buy the live product at the store, which has to be consumed in a short period of time. Yep. Um, it's, um, we call it the nutraceutical division. And so that market for us is, is, uh, looking somewhat promising relative to, uh, spray drying wheatgrass. Yeah. I was going to ask about value added products that you might be considering and that certainly would fit into without that uh, category. Yeah. So I, Ed, on your website, you say your, go- your three to five year goal is to open a hundred farms and you mentioned a few places, but where would the others be? Would they mainly be in California or are you thinking all over the world? Well, I, I, no, my, my, my vision is all over the world. Mm. Uh, we, we talked about these countries. Uh, there is going to be a partnership that would come together in the next couple of years with someone a lot bigger than me that could put this footprint together. Uh, but I would tell you that food production um, there are companies that sell deli sandwiches, and when they decided to put spinach uh, in front of you when you rolled by and told them what you wanted on, they completely mm-hmm. changed the spinach industry, the avocado industry. Right. Um, and so it's those types of folks that now understand food production and have come to us and said, 
We have 12 distribution centers. <laughs> Can you build one of these next to each one of our distribution centers? So sure. that, that, that type of uh, an approach is what we see. Uh, we're starting to branch out. Phase two is to build five that we would own and operate. Uh, but relative to some of these big uh, b- these big box people that we, we all shop at yeah. and these uh, SQRs that we have lunch at uh, periodically, uh, they're kind of game changers when you can take the logistical piece out of getting produce from California to New York and you can just build a growing unit there and supply all of those uh, locations in the Northeast and take just, just strictly take the transportation piece or reduce it quite a bit uh, has uh, an interesting footprint. You might be aware of the fact that Green Sense Farms has announced uh, 20 versions of what it's already doing in Portage, Indiana for China. I did not see that one. I know I've been tracking a few others, but I did not see that one. That's the rumor. That, 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 that's the rumor on the street, so to speak. But I've, I've seen it in print, so I have every reason to believe that they're going to do it. Hmm. And you know that we're opening a big we. The industry of vertical farming is opening a big one up here in Newark, uh, Aero Farm. So I think once even one of them gets established in a city, everybody mm-hmm. else will want to do that. And then you're, you're sitting in, the they would say, the catbird seat. You you have in your, the palm of your hand uh, the solution to a lot of people's problems. Yeah, and I, I have a lot of people that are s- kind of like sitting out in the parking lot watching. Exactly. <laughs> oh, no, no, that's right. They want to get involved, sure. and so again, our focus is to continue to scale uh, Irvine and get it into a, a max capacity type situation, and right. and then I think we're going to have a, a lot of fun uh, moving forward. Great. So, Ed, um, in in the course of developing urban produce, what would you say was the biggest challenge that you had to face? Um, I, I think uh, one of the two of you just mentioned it uh, a few moments ago, and you have to get people past the idea that if it's not grown in a field in in dirt or in soil, <laughs> that it's not going to taste like it should taste. Mm. Right. And, and so we, we had to do, especially with the chefs, we, so we do what is called chef tours. So we bring uh, chefs come in uh, as an, idea. On, on Mondays and we we grow and let them taste the product and, and, and they can put it on their palate and, and make their own decision. But I think uh, not just me, but hydroponics, hydroponics in general and pe- people like uh, Gene Giacomelli that, that put his money where his mouth is and said, sure. taste this. Yeah. Hmm. And also, I think maybe, maybe, I'm not sure, but maybe you can confirm or, or deny this one. The mayor of your city happens to be of Korean descent. That and is I've been to Korea several times, and I had the privilege of going to Suwon when they opened the Rural Development Authority's version of a vertical farm, which was only three stories tall, and it it was divided into two parts. One was to test out the different kinds of crops that they could grow under controlled environment conditions, and the other half was lighting solutions, and and they got 80% of their energy from either solar or geothermal energy. So that was about four years ago. And I've seen a recent announcement by the city of Seoul to actually disperse hundreds of versions of vertical farms throughout the landscape of that huge, sprawling city of 30 million people. Uh, maybe maybe your mayor got wind of that. <laughs> have, have you had a, a political um, meeting of the mind, so to speak, with the city council? And they, of course, you're, in, in, you're already in Orange County so that – They've already on board about water recycling and that sort of thing. So uh, it it looked like maybe all the stars, like I said in the beginning, had come together for uh, your operation. Uh, Did you meet with any opposition to begin with? Uh, No opposition. And Mayor Choi was uh, very gracious. He was uh, here for our grand opening. Great. And um, as you probably are aware of, uh, Irvine is a highly uh, Asian population here And so the products that we grow mean a lot to them. And uh, using uh, uh, South Korea as an example, that's where we have one of our patents is in South Korea. So, yes, we've had uh, ongoing dialogue with the mayor and the city council. Uh, They've asked me to meet with some of the local leaders, um, uh, Asian leaders here in uh, Irvine. And uh, so, yes, that is those those conversations are being had. Uh, That's excellent. 
Ed, do you think it'd be okay to chat with Danielle a bit? Absolutely. <laughs> she is my queen. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Of course. How you doing, Danielle? I'm good. How are you? So tell us what you do at uh, Urban Produce. Your title is Director of Marketing. Does it involve uh, these chef visits, for example? Yeah. So I, amongst marketing, I do a little bit of food safety, a little bit of sales, a little bit of packing and seating when I need to. But um, yeah, so I am starting a, we call it a grassroots movement. So I go out to local chefs and I talk about our product. I deliver our product. I let them taste it and see what they think about it. Um, it is a different style footprint for chefs when I bring it into their restaurants because <laughs> it is live and it's in it's just in a different format than a typical cut microgreen would come. Right. Um, so they, I, I bring them a sample. I let them try it out, see if it, if it works well in their kitchen. And so far we've had really great feedback. Everyone loves it. They love the shelf life on it, which, um, is huge for restaurants and especially with the, their, the costs that they have to incorporate with their food. So it's, it's been really great, and we've had some really great feedback. We've met some really great chefs that are willing to work with us and help us, and it's it's nice that the the culinary industry is so tight knit and small because you can get to a lot of people through sure. this person. Um, so it's been it's been a lot of fun. I really enjoy it, and I mm -hmm. am continuing to do it. I'm doing it tomorrow and Thursday and all next week. So it's it's going great. Have you met Alice Waters yet? I have not, no. Oh, you need to do that. She's uh, the progenitor of the slow food movement. And oh. she's up in San Francisco. She would just go crazy if she saw what you guys were doing. Oh, uh, yeah. No, I would. I mean, anytime I go somewhere, I was actually in Vegas over the weekend, and I put microgreens in my car, and I delivered <laughs> <laughs> you were transporting microgreens across a border? I don't know. <laughs> they didn't stop me. <laughs> By the way, I meant to add uh, to the conversation about the Korean connection that I live in Fort Lee, New Jersey, and it's 70% Korean. Wow. Okay. So we need one of your farms out here just to supply them with their leafy greens. I think you should <laughs> you should at least put one out here. Well, it's, in Irvine, it's definitely – there's definitely that – Yeah. That – kind of ethnicity out here and we get they love our wasabi bok choy they go crazy over it <laughs> so um, when you were in school danielle how much of what you learned are you now applying um so i would say my networking and how i learned i was lucky enough to be submerged into the produce industry through Cal Poly. They had a lot of really great um, clubs and groups you can join and different scholarships you could apply to that would allow you to go to one of the big conferences for produce or um, they offered a lot of classes that actually brought in professionals from the produce industry right. and talked about everything from seed to harvest to in the grocery store to merchandising to brokers so i definitely got a great round rounded education on every single aspect of the produce industry and i'm actually still connecting with some of those people i'm still i still get in touch with them it's kind of cool to see when my dad is on a panel speaking and he's next to one of the professors are one of the professors <laughs> I actually listen to from Cal Poly. So mm -hmm. need to still have those connections. And um, I kind of try to do my best on showing my dad the ropes when we're going somewhere new. <laughs> I've, I've kind of already been submerged into it because of Cal Poly, which they do such a fantastic job about learn by doing and really submerging you. So I wouldn't say so much all of like the textbook knowledge that I've gotten, but just yeah. the networking and meeting people and really getting me in front of the right people to talk to. Sure. What about uh, your ability to offer internships to college students that want to get involved in this? Could they come and work for you for a while? Um, yeah, we do it over the summer. We go to 
uh, Cal Poly specifically does job fairs that um, we've attended before and we it's really nice to meet you can meet the students face to face have a good conversation with them but generally over the summer is the best time because they're out of school they're able to come down here and commit serious time because it does take you do have to get infiltrated into the company and really understand the ropes there's a lot going on here I'm sure day in and day out so it's it would be hard for someone to do it during the school year to come down yeah, yeah. Like on a weekend every month or something like that. So we try to keep it um, keep it during the summer so that they can get the best experience. And how do you involve your community at, at large, get them to know what you're doing so they can become more supportive perhaps? Or Yeah, so I, um, I do farmer's markets. Um, I do go out and... Um, talk about our product, get it in front of people. And then we actually have a lot of tours come in from um, oh, as nice. far as bloggers to, I actually have a group of homeschoolers coming in today um, at 11 o'clock. And we do a lot of, there's some culinary schools that come in here as well um, with students that are in just learning to become chefs and whatnot. We've had high schools reach out to us. So we do a lot of social media. Um, I, my era, my millennial era that my dad, dad always refers to is very involved with social media. And so we use a lot of that and it's actually been really great because we're able to connect with bloggers that then know other bloggers or know other people within our community. So we have had blogging events where they are able to come in and take pictures and write their own articles. And we've actually gotten some tours out of them as well because nice. they, I mean, they have children, they go to schools, they have sure. interests. So we're also doing a tour for the Girl Scouts in December. So we try to do as much as we can within the community and really get out there and talk about it and education. Because our product is a lot about education. Um, most people don't quite know what microgreens are, but I try to <laughs> educate as much as I can. I was going to ask you about the social media because I see you're on... Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, LinkedIn, Instagram. Is that, do you take care of those yourself? Um, I, I work with someone else and we tag team it because it, it can be a lot of work, but yes. Because yeah, you're pretty active. I just see a tweet six minutes ago. It's pretty, <laughs> probably not you. Yeah, yeah, we try. I mean, it's kind of, you got to get, you got to get seen somewhere. So what? we're on pretty much every platform you yeah. can be on. Have you well, made any YouTube uh, versions that people? Of course, you have. I've seen think, three uh, of them now. Do you have a YouTube yeah. channel? <laughs> yes, we do have a YouTube channel. Um, mm -hmm. There's a couple of videos up there right now, and we. I always have stuff in the works as far as new videos to talk about, new videos to film. But so yeah, it's in the works. But it it is up there. You can go. I have a little watering video and a how to cut mm -hmm. your mic video yeah i saw that one that was very nicely done yeah i think all this works well i mean that's how we spread the word about our podcasts exactly. right we use social media a lot you can reach so many people that you could not before mm -hmm. right you can do things that were prohibitive because of cost so yeah. i would guess for a business you can do the same things as well right? absolutely yeah especially as a startup social media is fantastic and even just some of the different Facebook ads and different outlets you can use that don't cost an arm and a leg. Yep. So, Danielle, is this the best job you ever had? Absolutely. <laughs> and is it the only job you've ever had? <laughs> she wants a raise. Uh, no, it's not. I actually, I graduated and went to work for someone else. Oh, before good. <laughs> I, before this even got started, actually, it was kind of really the stars aligned and God was uh, watching uh, upon us because... Uh, I got a degree in agricultural business, and my dad was still in the technology business dealing with lawyers. So what did you think when he approached you and said, you want to come work for uh, Urban Produce? Were you skeptical? Did you embrace it immediately? How'd that go? I loved it. Mm -hmm. I, I have always, I am such a foodie. I love food. Mm -hmm. And so just the fact that, and I, I have a health background. I'm also a certified nutritionist. So... It really allowed me to bring my love for food and my love for f healthful food together mm -hmm. and kind of uh, spread that word and really dive deeper into 
what, how I can help people eat healthier and also how it's grown because I, I don't think everyone is as educated as they should be about where their food is coming from. Yes, it's getting better. Yes, a lot of people are wanting locally grown food, but they also need to understand what exactly locally grown food is Um, because we don't want to walk into our supermarket and have it say locally grown and it's from Maine or something like that. (laughs) Grown inside the USA. (laughs) They wouldn't be lying, but. uh... (laughs) Right. But no, I, I feel very blessed to be able to work here. So as, as urban produce expands, because you're going to have a hundred farms one day, maybe more. What is your role going to be? Are you going to stay there? Are you going to move somewhere else? And, you're going to be marketing director for everything. Do you have do you have any sense? Um, I mean, as it grows, I'm definitely going to grow with the company, and hopefully, one day I can let my dad retire and take over his job. <laughs> <laughs> Is he smiling? <laughs> yeah, it's golf club in hand, so he's ready to go. Golf club in hand. I love it. <laughs> sounds like, it sounds like a great plan. Yeah. Yeah. Danielle, thanks for chatting with us. Yeah. Sure. Thank you for having us. You're I, welcome. Could you put on uh, Ed? We can thank him as well. Yes, absolutely. As well, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, I look forward to uh, hooking up with you guys the next time we uh, can get engaged with a, uh, a seminar or a conference and, and sincerely appreciate you uh, allowing us the time today. Well, our pleasure. It yeah, was, it was great. definitely it was great. fantastic. Really nice. Thank you both. Thanks for sharing your information. Absolutely. And you sound great. Both of you have great voices. You have radio voices and a good connection, too. (laughs) Come on. This is Hollywood. I mean, almost Hollywood. (laughs) Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. You betcha. Have a great day. See ya. Bye-bye. You can find Urban Agriculture at iTunes and also at urbanag.ws. And if you want to send us questions and comments, send them to urbanag at urbanag.ws. Dixon de Pommier, the father of vertical farming. <laughs> we should, I should say that at the onset of urban agriculture. Well, Are you the farmer of vertical farming? I'm not the father because with a father you need a mother. <laughs> no, you don't. No, you Why? Don't. Immaculate conception. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> hermaphrodism. <laughs> Vegetative reproduction. <laughs> you can find Dixon at urbanag.ws, verticalfarm.com. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent. This was fun. I'm Vincent Yellow. You can find me at virology.ws. The music you hear on urban agriculture is performed by John Harrison with the Wichita State University Chamber Players and Ronald Jenkies, whose work you can find at ronaldjenkies.com. You've been listening to Urban Agriculture. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Vince, see you upstairs at the Vertical Farm. Bet some microgreens exactly <laughs> some wasabi bok choy <laughs>